Are you ready to hear God's word this morning? All right, we are ready. I hope you are. If you would take your Bibles to Psalm 51 today. Psalm 51, and we are going to get started here this morning. As I said in Sunday school, uh, the Lord just so leaded today that the messages, I taught a lesson in Sunday school this morning, uh, looking at the, the, the lordship of the Lord in our life, and a convicting message it was, and I believe this message is a convicting message as well if we apply it to our hearts today, uh, and I told them as well as I'll tell you, I'm going to leave the convicting up to the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to preach the word to you, and let the Spirit move as he he wills and directs, uh, but I do pray uh, that you'd be attentive to what God has for us this morning. Uh, psalm 51, uh, before I get into this psalm, before I read uh, here a good portion of it, I want to just start with where we're headed with all of this to start to uh, tie this bow together. Uh, we're going to be looking at the subject today of repentance. What is repentance? Why do we need to repent? Uh, you say, well, I repented of my sins. I know Jesus is my Savior. That is wonderful. I'm glad you can know that today. If you don't know that today, we'll talk about that here just in a little bit. But let me tell you, uh, repentance doesn't just stop then. There are sins we still do where we at times need to be repentant of. And you've heard uh, many, many messages, I'm sure. Uh, you've heard many ideas or definitions of repentance. Uh, some would say, and this is a great definition, it's almost a turning around, if you would. You're headed in one direction, and you decide to turn and go in a totally different direction. Others would say it's a 360 degrees in life. I will correct that. That's not repentance. 360 degrees only gets you right back to where you started. All right? You need a 180 and point yourself in a different direction. That's repentance. Now, this morning, I want to give you a formula, and you'll see as we move through here what this formula will help as we often do need to repent, seeing our sin. That formula is four simple words. Seeing, seeing, so, sorrowing, Turning and changing. Seeing, sorrowing, turning and changing. You say, how do I practice that? First, you see your sin. You're sorrowing over your sin. Then you are turning from your sin. Then you're changing your direction. That is repentance. That's what we're going to talk about today. We all need to do it at times. We needed to repent of our sin and trust Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And after that, there are times we still sin. We still fall. There are things that we get ourselves into that we need to repent of. We need to practice this formula. Many of you heard the illustration of uh, that young man that uh, bought that unruly parrot. He tried to train him and train him and train him, and this parrot was just awful. I mean, just said bad words, talked bad, was just disrespectful, all these things. And this young man worked and worked and worked on this parrot. He tried to teach him how to be loving and how to say nice things. It just seemed the parrot got worse and worse and worse and worse. The young man finally got so frustrated, he started to yell at the parrot. Well, the parrot just started yelling back then. Started even being more vulgar and more, more uh, uh, obnoxious things. And the man finally started to shake the parrot. And again, the parrot just squawked and, and fought and kicked and just said these vulgar things. The, the man finally got so frustrated, he threw the parrot in the freezer thinking it'd teach him a lesson. A minute two went by, and man, this parrot squawked and screamed and said all these nasty things, and all of a sudden there's dead silence. The man thought to himself, man, I wonder if I hurt this bird. I really kind of liked the bird. I just didn't like his mouth. So he opened up the freezer, and the minute he did, the parrot came out and said, sir, I need to apologize to you. The parrot said, my mouth has been horrible. I've said vulgar things. I've said nasty things. And I want to tell you today that I'm going to change my ways. I'm a new parrot. Uh, I'll be loving. I'll say kind words. I'll never treat you that way again. The man thought, man, this is great. And just before he got to ask the parrot what changed his mind, the parrot blurted out, tell me, what did the turkey do? <laughs>
that, that is repentance. That's repentance. That little bird just taught you a lesson about how to repent. He saw the error of his ways. He changed what he was saying. He changed how he treated that young man, and he repented. That's a great illustration, I know. First Samuel, you don't have to turn there, but chapters 11 and 12, I just want to give you some background because Psalm 51 is going to be David's repentance. King David, if you will, this is his psalm of repentance. We'll read that in a moment. But why did David get to this point? What did David do where he needed to repent? David was a godly man. David was a man after God's own heart. We see David being raised and ordained to, to, to serve God and, and reign and, and all of these wonderful things God had set him aside to do. What then would cause King David to need to write a psalm like this of repentance? Many of you know the story as, we, as it's told in the scripture. David, during the time of war, decided to stay back. We don't really know why he did that. But when the kings would go off to war, David lingered. And in that moment of idleness, as he was uh, in his castle uh, where he was, it was the time of day where uh, the women would bathe and Bathsheba went out and be, uh, began to bathe herself. And David went and looked upon her and lusted after her. Let me start by saying that first sin was just a simple little sin, if you would. There's no such thing, but hear me out. A sin of idleness led David then to lust after her. His lust built so greatly within him. This is King David, mind you now. He thought, I wanted to have her. So he called for Bathsheba and she came into his chamber and David went in unto her committed immorality, committed great fornication against God. David had a relationship with her that he never should have had. All because the Bible says at the times when the kings go forth to war, David stayed back. But then guess what as sin often does, it just didn't stop there. It started to destroy started to destroy David, started to destroy those around him. He began to connive and, conceit, con, uh, connive and, and plan and, and work this plan out. How do I get out of this dilemma? Because now Bathsheba had become pregnant. What does he do? See where sin takes you? Layer upon layer, just of depravity. This is man after God's own heart, mind you. Decides, well, I'll have her husband come back and they'll have some family time together, if you will, uh, some private time, and we'll just, it'll all be okay. Uriah will think that this is his child and life will be good. Uriah was an honorable man. He came off the battle. Listen to this now. He came off the battle and thought, you know what, if my men are out there, I can't spend this kind of enjoyment in my life. He wouldn't go into his wife. He wouldn't spend that time with her because his men were at war. David then begins to think, what am I going to do? Now what? So this first sin of idleness now leads him to make a decision to write a letter to the captain in charge to say, I want you to send Uriah to the front of the line, to the front of the battle. David knowing that Uriah going to the front of that line would be killed in battle. And that would clean it all up. Nobody would ever know then. But as sin does, you can't just let it go. And if you serve God today, if you're a child of God, listen to me. God won't let it go. God won't let it go. He will convict your heart. He will do his best to draw you back to him so that you and I will seek true repentance. And that's what David then started to do in Psalm 51. We'll read this psalm together now. If you have the heading there in your Bible, mine reads the song of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him 
after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now the sin was public. Now David had to face it. It was no longer a secret between him and Bathsheba. Here's what a man of God does. Psalm 51 verse 1, David cries, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Boy, it sure sounds like David wants to get this right, doesn't he? David realizes what he's done. He realizes, and we'll talk about this in a moment, that he's not only sinned against Bathsheba, he's not only sinned against uh, 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 the, the people he is serving, he's sinned against an almighty God. Verse 4, Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part of uh, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Sure sounds like a broken man, doesn't it? Sounds like a man seeking repentance, doesn't it? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thine presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors my, thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David really demonstrated this formula he saw his sin. He became sorrowful over his sin. He turned from his sin and he changed his direction. What I want you to hear this morning is even great Christians, hear this now, even the greatest of Christians can sin and disappoint God. Amen. However, there is repentance freely given for all who will seek it. There is restoration if you will seek it. Uh, how we deal with our sin determines how God will use us in the future. How we deal with this unconfessed sin, if you will, how we deal with it determines how God will so choose to use you and me. One man said, if we put off repentance another day, we have a day more to repent of and a day less to repent in. Hear that? It just eats you. Sin destroys. Sin decays. And even after David's repentance, we see sin having its grip of destruction on David's life. Uriah's death the baby's death, other things to follow with other children of David, all as a result of idleness, if you would. Get it cleaned up. I said to you this morning, this ought to be a convicting message. I will let the Holy Spirit work in your life, but this ought to be a convicting message. It is to my heart. We're not perfect. There are times we fail God. There are times we openly sin against God. And we need to have the humility, as David demonstrated here, to seek true repentance. What are these key truths of repentance? There's four of them this morning I'd like to present to you. The first key truth to repentance is a willingness to take personal responsibility for our sin. A willingness to take personal responsibility of our sin. I won't read them again, but if you read through verses 1 through 9, look at the use of the personal pronoun there. Me, my, I, David, over and over again says, God, I have done this evil. My sins are ever before you. 
over and over again. He's taking re personal responsibility, knowing that he has sinned against an almighty God. You cannot repent if you insist on blaming someone else. I cannot repent of my sin if I continually insist that it's someone else's fault. Get a lesson from David here. Have mercy upon me. Wash me. For I acknowledge I have sinned. There's a statement we use in counseling. Or when a person sits before you and they, 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 they tell you a statement and then they follow that statement up with the word but. Well, Pastor Fisher, you know, this and this and this and this, I really, but. You know what we learned there? It means you just want me to forget everything you just said. That doesn't matter. Now you're really going to tell me what you think. That's what we do with God. God, I know I've sinned, but... God, I know I sinned, but you know, you just don't understand how, how aggravating that person in my life is. God, I understand I sinned, but you don't understand the financial crisis we're in. Take personal responsibility for your sin. There's no such thing as I'm sorry, but. Those of you who are parents, you try that today on your child. Or you let your child try that on you. I'm sorry, Mom and Dad, for disobeying you, but my friend started it. Does that work with you? That doesn't work with me. I'm sorry, Mom and Dad. I know you only said I could have two, but there was only one left. So I took that last one. There's personal responsibility. David demonstrates that for you and I. You say, how can the scripture say this is a man after God's own heart? Because this man, when he sinned, he took personal responsibility and sought repentance from an almighty God. And then God was able to continue to use him. Just to clarify this point quickly, I won't read this for you, but Luke chapter 15, you can find the prodigal son, verses 11 through 19, and you'll see that story through these verses where he asked his father for all his wealth, give me my inheritance, and he went and squandered it. Living with pigs, eating off the pigs, got to a point of just total, total destruction in his life. You know what the Word of God says, the statement he makes? The Word of God says, and when he came to himself, that's when he went back home. That's when he went and sought for me. He was willing to be a slave to his father. When he came to himself, that's how we repent. We have to first acknowledge personal responsibility. When I sin, it is not my wife's fault. When I sin, it is not my son's fault. When I sin, it is not your fault. However frustrating some of you may make me. I'm just teasing. <laughs> now they're wondering which ones. I didn't make any eye contact, see, when I said that. So. It's my fault. No one's fault. David said, Lord... Take my sin. See my sin. The second key to repentance is a recognition that all sin is ultimately against God. Look at verses 3 and 4. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Look at verse 4. Against thee, thee only, who is he talking to, God? Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. All sin is ultimately against God. That ought to convict your heart today. You say, why should we choose repentance? Because your sin ought to convict you. Because your sin ought to make you pause and you ought to remember that when you sinned, you're sinning against an almighty God that sent his son to die for you and me for that very sin. Period. 
a recognition that all sin ultimately is against God. When we lie, we sin against God. When we are unkind, we sin against God. When we gossip, we sin against God. And I could go on and on and on. When we sin, it is against a holy God. And we cannot get right with others before we get right with God. Examine your heart today. Examine your life. Say, I'm not that bad. You know what? I don't think I'm that bad either. But there are times I still sin. There are times I need to go to an almighty God and ask for forgiveness. There are times I sit where you're sitting and hear a message that you're hearing today preached. And let me tell you what, I'm preaching it, but this was preached to me way before I brought it to you in my studies. I sit where you're sitting. I've heard these messages preached. And you know what? I'm open to when God convicts my heart. Are you? Can you honestly say today, you came in this building wanting to hear from God. And if you can, and maybe you weren't planning that, but now you are, if you can say that right now, then God is speaking to you just as he's speaking to me. And when he presses my heart and he reveals a sin in my life, it's before him. I realize that my sin is a sin before an almighty God. And I want to get those things right. I don't know about you. I don't want it to stay unconfessed. I don't want to stay unrepentant. I want to see an illustration. I want to see a model from David and follow it in scripture. I no longer want the fellowship between me and my Savior broken. I want it restored. All I ask is you consider that today. A willingness to take personal responsibility for your sin. A recognition that all sin is ultimately against God. And a crying out to God for forgiveness and cleansing. Look at verses 7 through 9. David cries out, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my transgressions. He's crying out for forgiveness. He's crying out for cleansing of his evil, wicked way. You know what's neat about this? You know what's so wonderful about Scripture? When we do that, when we see our sin, we're confronted by our sin, God convicts us of our sin, we realize we need to get that sin out and clean it out of our lives. You know what the scripture says in 1 John? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us all sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the God you serve. He's a God that's just simply pleading, ask for forgiveness, turn around from your sin, and I will forgive you. The forgiveness is available. James 4, verses 6 through 10. I'll read these to you if you don't want to turn there. Listen to this. But he giveth more grace. I think that's something. You say, how can an almighty God give more grace? We talk about his grace, don't we? Talk about how wonderful it is. Scripture says he giveth more grace. Whereof he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit your ther their selves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Listen to this now. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Gives us a list, if you will, of wickedness, 
of what we are in his sight. Filthy, double-minded. Confess them, get them right, and he will lift you up. There's an illustration of a man that would come to the altar every Sunday after service and pray during the invitation time. Simple prayer. He'd come down front. He'd always want to pray with his pastor. They would bow together. The man would say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Take these cobwebs out of my life. And he'd be done. This went on for weeks, weeks, months, every Sunday. Lord, take these sins out of my life. Take these cobwebs from me as well. Every week, months and months. Finally, the pastor became so frustrated. That Sunday, sure enough, the man came down forward once again, prayed his prayer, Lord, forgive me of these sins. Take these cobwebs out of my life. The pastor finally interrupted and said, Lord, please kill the spider. <laughs> Think about that. Lord, kill the spider. Many times we ask God to forgive us for our sins, but we leave the source of temptation in our lives. Every week this man would cry for forgiveness and he wouldn't get that source of temptation out of his life. A willingness to take personal responsibility, a recognition that sin ultimately is against God, a crying out to God for forgiveness and cleansing, and then fourthly, a desire to restore our relationship with the holy God. Boy, I hope you have that desire today. I hope your sin affects you in a way that it, it just burns within you to get it right with the Lord. Look at verses 10 through 12. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Listen, when a child sins against his parents, they do not stop being their parent. However, the child's fellowship is affected with his parents. The parent's willingness to reward the child with extra blessings is affected. And that is true for you and I today. When we sin against God, a couple things happen. Our fellowship is broken and blessings often cease. God doesn't bless unrighteousness, doesn't condone it, wants nothing to do with it. When we have unrepentant sin in our lives, we lose two things, fellowship and blessings. That's why it's so important to clear them up. That's why it's so important, even in a message today, God speak into your heart, clear it up today. Get that sin confessed to him. Find the tools in scripture to overcome it in your life. Repent, turn around, and then see the blessings of God. Have that fellowship restored. Don't go another day. Because you know what it'll do? This is what it does. There's a choice to be made this morning. Repent or live with unconfessed sin. True repentance strengthens us with the desire to serve the Lord. Listen to that. True repentance strengthens us with the desire to serve the Lord. I won't read the rest of this psalm here, but we're going to go through some of these things here just quickly. When we repent, we will have a desire to help others who are in sin. You see that in verse 13. Also in verse 13, we will have a desire to win souls to Christ. But that is when we are repentant. Look at verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. True repentance brings that desire. 
True repentance, we will have a desire to sing and speak of God's goodness. Look at verses 14 and 15. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. True repentance brings a desire to sing and speak God's goodness. Brother Riley spoke about this in our opening this morning. Well, we ought to have a song of praise on our lips. We ought to be a people that are singing continually the praises of God. If you're aligned in what this world has to offer, you're mistaken. It's by what God does in your life. True repentance also will give us a desire to have a broken and a contrite heart. Look at verses 16 and 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. That's what true repentance does strengthens us with the desire to help others, to win souls, to sing and speak of God's goodness. It gives us the desire to have a broken and a contrite heart. And I don't know about you, but I would sure like all those things. Here's the other side of that coin. Unconfessed sin robs us of what God desires for you and I to have. Where true repentance brings things, unconfessed sin robs us of things. First thing that robs us of is peace. You can see that in verse 3. Instead of peace, we feel guilty. You ever had unconfessed sin in your life? Don't feel very good, do you? Don't feel very righteous, do you? probably agree with me probably feel pretty guilty don't you why because it's before an almighty God unconfessed sin not also robs us of peace but it robs us of cleansing verse 7 instead of cleansing we feel dirty feel dirty before an almighty God you may even feel dirty before your loved ones they might not even know but yet you have that feeling of just dirtiness because you know you're in sin Unconfessed sin not also robs us from peace and cleansing. In verse 8 and 12, we see it robs us of joy. Instead of joy, you know what we get? We get sorrow. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be sorrowful. Nobody likes to be sorrowful. That's what unconfessed sin will do. Unconfessed sin robs us, verse 12 through 13, of service. Instead of service, we feel unusable. Now, I think this is where most Christians get hit. Because we sometimes, we can kind of, you know, we can can live a little bit, you know, with with feeling dirty. We can even, we know God's joy, so we we can really kind of go without joy. But then we get in church, and, and we get around God's people, and we start to go, well, I just can't be used here. God would never use me. That's a lie of the devil. The only reason God may not be using you is because there's unconfessed sin in your life. Robs you of peace, cleansing, joy, service. Lastly, robs us of fellowship. Verse 11. Instead, fellowship. Instead, we feel distant from God. That's not a place you or I want to be. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions this morning and we'll be done. As God works in your heart, and I hope he is through his spirit this morning. Christian, I'm going to speak to you first. You say, I know I'm born again. I know there was a time I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's not a doubt in my mind that when I die, I'm going to heaven. These first questions are for you. Is there something you need to repent of today? God's word lays it out for us. 
I examined my own heart weeks ago preparing this. And since then, just to clarify, <laughs> I just hear it now. Pastor Fisher only asked God for forgiveness once in his last three months. Is there something you need to repent from? And now hear me. That's okay. That's okay. That's why you're here today, maybe. Maybe the Spirit's working in your heart. And you know what? You probably feel a little embarrassed. You probably feel a little bit uncomfortable. That's okay. What God wants you to do is God wants you to put this formula in place. He wants you to walk out of those doors today repenting of, repentant of your sin. Knowing your fellowship's restored. Secondly, are there unconfessed sins in your life? Anything in your life that you have not repented from? Listen, Christian friend, God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God had great plans for King David. And you and I don't know. We don't know what would have happened in David's life if he never came to repentance. If we never saw Psalm 51, but we do know he came to it. And we do know how God used him after that. Same God then, same God today. He's desiring to use you and me in the same way. Just get it right. I told you a minute ago, I've sat where you're sitting. I just want to get it right. I can be stubborn. I can be proud. And I can leave and I can feel guilty and dirty and sorrowful and usable and distant from God. I just want to get it right. Lord, forgive me. Lord, cleanse me as David cried out. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Lord, use me. I hope that's your prayer today. And then if there's someone here today that's never repented of their sin, there's never been a time where you've ever called on God to forgive you of your sin, you're probably not his child. In fact, the Bible says you're not. But you can be today. You can be today. This room is full of people that one day had a great weight of sin in their life and they called to an almighty God and they believed in a Jesus Christ that came to this earth to die for their sin and that he was buried and that he rose again victorious over death in the grave that you and I could have eternal life. And there's a room full of people today that called on him to be their savior that said these very things, God, forgive me of my sin. God, I know the weight, the debt of what that sin caused and created, that you had to send your son, and then they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Come to know him today. And those things we talked about, a desire to help others, a desire to win souls, to see God's goodness, to sing of his goodness, to have peace, cleansing, joy, service, fellowship. God just wants to give it to you. But you have to be his child first. Romans 10, 10 and 11. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made nigh unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And two verses later in verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're here today and you've never called on the name of the Lord to be saved or you're listening online this morning, make that decision right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Go before an almighty God with open arms, with a repentant heart, and just see what God has for you. It's a life that we can't even really begin to describe it's wonderful. 
We can give you definitions. We can talk about peace and cleansing and joy. But until you're his child, you just don't truly ever understand. Don't leave here today not knowing you're a child of God. Not knowing that your sin debt has been paid for. And not only been paid for, but been covered by the precious blood of Jesus Christ because you put your faith and trust in him to be your savior. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for this time together, Lord, in your house. We are so thankful for this message, Lord, even in my life, Lord, that you convicted in in my heart, Lord, any sin that I may have. God, I pray today that you would be with this congregation, these folks that are here. God, I believe your spirit is working. They're here for a purpose. It's not by chance they're sitting under the preaching of your word this morning. God, you want to work in their life. You want to work in my life. But God, we must first want you to work. So God, I pray today you'd be with anyone that's here that first and foremost has never received Christ. They would do that today. And then God, for other Christians that, Lord, maybe there's unconfessed sin in their life. Maybe, Lord, there are sins they're unrepentant of that, Lord, they would get that cleared up today. God, I pray that your spirit would work here today. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, no one looking around, please. Just want to ask two simple questions. We spoke a lot about Christ today and knowing him to be your savior and knowing how that he uh, paid the way to cover your sin. The question I have for you today is, has there been a time in your life where you know without a shadow of a doubt that you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, Pastor Fisher, I know today that I'm saved 100%. That's me. He's forgiven my sin. I repented of my sin. I know if I died right now, I'd be in heaven. If you know that today, would you just slip your hand up nice and tall? Hands all over the room. Hands all over. You may put them down. I couldn't tell if there were hands that didn't go up this morning. But I want to give you an opportunity just in case. If there's someone here that said, Pastor Fisher, I didn't raise my hand because I don't know. Listen, we want to show you today how you can know. You don't have to question it anymore. We'll take God's word, take you to a room, men with men, women with women, and we will show you in scripture how you can know. Is there someone today that say, I want to know today how to be saved? Anyone like that? Slip up your hand nice and tall. I'll give it just a few seconds. I need to know today. I need to get that right. Anyone at all? All right, then, Christian friend, listen. I'm not going to have you raise your hand this morning. But I am going to ask, is there any sin in your life that maybe you need to get right with God? Maybe it's been unconfessed for a while. Maybe you're just unrepentant. Maybe maybe you just, today, the Spirit pointed it out to you, revealed it to you today, and you want to get that right. We're going to sing a verse invitation in just a moment. This altar is going to be free to you. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. You come do business with God. Come and spend time in prayer. You can pray right there in your seat. But let God work in your life. Don't leave today with unconfessed sin in your life. Father, bless this invitation time. We pray your spirit would work. Lord, not of man's words, but of your spirit alone, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Brown, would you come?